The following content has been provided by RWTH, Aachen University. We're going to now move into a topic um, of where knowledge is stored. It seems like it has nothing to do with usability, but it's very much about usability. Um, We'll do a quick um, experiment here. Please take out a piece of paper uh, and turn around your smartphones. No using smartphones right now because I don't want you to look at them and, and cheat. Uh, just um, write down real quick for yourself on a piece of paper the digit layout of a telephone, you know, one with push buttons obviously, not with a rotary dial, um, and of a calculator. All right, so uh, this shouldn't have taken too long. Um, let's see, so I think this is, most people will get this right, right? I'm not, I'm, this is not the point here. Um, but you've probably all realized that on a phone, the buttons are arranged in this order, right? It starts with the one at the top, and then goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, and the zero is in the middle at the bottom, and then you've got usually the, the star key, the asterisk, and the pound key or hash sign um, on the other side. Now, the calculator, on the other hand, has the one at the bottom. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the zero at the bottom in the, in the bottom row. And you often have a percent, uh, or, or like a, a comma sign, or an equal sign, or something like this down here. So it often looks a little different. So my point to this is, let, let's see real quick here. Um, who made a little mistake in one or the other of these two layouts here? It's okay, I'm not going to remember you. Okay, that's about 30, 40, maybe even 50%. That should be maybe surprising because you've all used calculators, uh, you've all used telephones all the time, right? And we would think that if I use something so many times, that's what an engineer would ex expect. The user has learned what it looks like. But it seems that we haven't learned this in the way that we think we learn. It seems almost like our brains are lazy bastards. They are just, I'm not going to remember that because the next time I got to punch those keys, they're going to be right in front of me again. I'm just going to look and use them. So what your brain is doing there, what your memory is doing there, um, is it's using knowledge that's out there in the world. Okay, so knowledge in the world means it's knowledge, it's it's information that is being put in front of you. You can see it, you can hear it, whatever, you can perceive it. There is no need to store it in your, in your brain because it's out there. Right? The signage, if you like, the documentation, the manual, even the numbers on a, you know, on, a, on a telephone keyboard are a tiny little bit of a manual, right? a user manual. Press this button to get a zero, right? that's what it says. Um, these labels, they all help you um, not having to remember all this stuff in your head. Um, and this, all, of course, all comes down to our limited, uh, you know, especially working memory, right? When you're using this device, you're, you're punching in numbers, and you're, it's easier for your brain to just go and, and look at the mapping and then type in numbers, um, and then, you know, not store the mapping so that you could repro uh, reproduce it out of context. It's not necessary. The main part here was, um, how many of you, before we did this little experiment, had not, well, this is a negative question, how many of you have not thought about, consciously, the fact that you're actually using two different keyboards here? How many hadn't realized this? Okay, that's way more than 50%. So most people don't realize this, although it should actually strike us as, you know, and when you look at this from a technical point of view, why are the two keyboards different? That's really strange, right? Um, so the knowledge is in the world, which button is where, um, um, through labels, right? We, we put numbers on them. Um, I had a great story. I went to the, uh, um, the hairdresser the other day and uh, got a haircut. And then um, next to me was, uh, was a guy um, who uh, uh, you know, was, it was, uh, was sitting there getting his haircut too. And um, his wife came in and said, oh, honey, I'm going to get some money from the ATM. Um, can you give me the, uh, our... our um, you know, ATM card. 
And he said, yeah, here's the ATM card. And then she said, oh, um, what's the secret number? She was saying that while I was sitting right next to her. Anyway. Um, and it was funny. The guy was like, oh, wait a minute. Ah, I think it's like 1379, right? So he was actually using motor memory of the movement of his fingers on the keypad of the ATM in order to remember that. And you've probably had the same thing, right? If you ever, when you, when you type in your key, you know, your, your pin, it's, it's more like a physical pattern that you remember. Um, so he was kind of like, he was using his motor memory and then because, but he didn't know the mapping of the keys in his head. He went like this and then he got out his smartphone and looked at the smartphone and said, okay, so here's the keyboard layout of the smartphone. So what I'm typing must be, you know, one, three, seven, nine. You know, luckily for him, the mapping on the ATM is the same as the mapping on the smartphone. If he had used the calculator app for, to find that out, it would have been a little problem. Um, or if that had happened in Italy, like an Italian friend told me, because in Italy, the ATMs have keyboards that are the other way around. So they don't follow the phone layout, they follow the calculator keyboard, which can mess you up no end. If you have your pin memorized as a haptic pattern and the keyboard changes, you know, you're out of luck. Okay, so this is just to show knowledge, a lot of knowledge that we use, we don't actually have in our head. We just get it out of the world. Um, to continue this, <coughs> this was a device um, that was announced, oh, this was in like early, early 2000s, um, the OQO, one of the first like truly like sub netbook portable kind of PDA things that actually was running a full version of Windows. Not that that's a good idea, but that was what's going on. Uh, and the interesting thing, though, with this device was, uh, you know, it had a alphanumeric, it had this, this standard alphabetical keyboard, and it had this keypad next to it. Um, and everybody's like, okay, it was like a PC keyboard. But no, if you look closely, that keyboard was actually laid out not like what you would expect, like a, uh, like a calculator keyboard, which you have on your PC, but it was actually laid out like a phone keyboard. And that, of course, was very strange. You know, I think this was one of the first devices that had a SIM card built, and then somehow the designers probably thought, oh, SIM card, it's a phone, so we're going to put a phone keypad next to it. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that you know, any, like, I don't know, traveling salesmen or accountants that were using this on the road got messed up no end with this mapping of the, of the device. Okay, so in the end, there's a lot of knowledge that's not in your head, but it's in the world. So be, despite the fact that we have less than perfect knowledge, um, we can behave in a very precise way. And the question that we're asking here is like, how is that possible? And knowledge in the world, of course, is helping us do that. Because our behavior is, in the end, not determined simply by what we have in our head. We don't, you know, we don't run on, on like a robotic instruction set and can do something without any feedback from the outside. We constantly use information from the outside, pull it in and use it as a mix, world knowledge and, and knowledge in the head, to do something. Um, we only need, actually, knowledge. We don't need to know things precisely. We just need to know them well enough so that when the action comes around, we can do the right thing. You know, distinguish the right behavior from the wrong behavior. Um, another example here, and again, uh, don't take out your smartphones or your uh, filled purses. Um, just think real quick and, and maybe draw, or like, but you know, don't get too artistic. Um, what is on the front and on the back of the German one cent coin? So here, here's the solution to our little riddle here. The front of the, the coin actually has the one on it, and it says euro cent, then it has these cool stripes on it, and it has a little map on it. The back has these stars around it, and has a little leaf, um, acorn leaf, I think, on the back. Um, let's see. Again, raise your hands if there was, was something about that that you didn't quite get right. Okay, 100%. Thank you. Um, that's, that's perfectly fine. I, I saw everybody agrees on, like, it's a round shape, right? And beyond that, it gets, it gets hazy. Um, but that's fine, because think about what we just said. You don't need to know exactly what the one cent coin looks like, unless you're planning on forging it. Um, you only need to know how to distinguish it from the others that are there in your purse, 
right? And so the size of the coin, the thickness, the color of the material, those are the major cues that you go by when you're looking for a one cent coin or for something else than a one cent coin. Right? You actually don't even need to look at it closely because you know, oh, that tiny little reddish thing there, that's the one cent coin. And maybe you know that there's a one on it, probably. How many people got the one right on the front? Okay, yeah, near 100, right? Uh, how many people got the, uh, the little map of, of Europe right? Uh, like 20%. See, so that doesn't matter, right? What you look for is like, is it a one? So we just remember the things that are important for us to distinguish and to act reliably. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.